Okay. So, so Acacia. So we call this um, a managing project data module. So what we are looking to learn in this module are that you can understand what is an object storage and what are its benefits. Uh, set up your own Akasha credentials to be ready to use it. And basically, first kind of um, usage of Akasha uh, uh, storing and retrieving data from there. Okay, so the idea is the following. So in a in a relatively complex uh, workflow for research, these things may happen. So probably there is already existing data or collected data from somewhere that you need to uh, bring to Cetonix to um, manage. So in this first stage, if data already exists, should it should go probably directly to a store place, which is for us Acacia. So we call that store. Then when you are ready, you you have ready your scripts and you have tested them. Um you probably bring your data towards the file system of Cetonix. So you bring it to, to scratch. For that we are using the concept of staging. So basically putting the, your data ready. Then you can process it. Uh, you can generate some results that will go directly to Scratch. If you want, those results can go again to Acacia for analyzing later or for basically keeping it them for the rest of the project. But many times those output results are just checkpoints. So you need to process them again to keep going and running your simulations many, many times uh, from the place the previous one stopped to generate more. If it's a simulation that shows something changing in time to basically advance in time, for example. Then, for example, you can stop at some point. You cannot keep your data in scratch. You need to move it to Acacia, to this storage, and then Later, a couple of weeks, you come back and you need to uh, continue processing that, that data. Then from Acacia, you stage it again towards Scratch and keep processing. So these are examples of two loop cycles of staging, storing, staging, storing. And that is what you need to do if, if you need to keep your data beyond the 30 days limit that we have in Scratch. Then, for example, you can, rather than staging your data in Cetonix itself, you can stage it to the Scratch file, uh, system of the visualization installations, uh, and then do something with them outside of Cetonix, but in our computers assigned for visualization. And then probably you generate some images, uh, graphical, uh, pictures and movies, and probably you store them again into Acacia. And probably at some point, you just don't want them to use them just inside POSI. You want to use them somewhere else. So you remove them from Acacia towards wherever you want. Um, so that's basically Acacia for us is becoming a very important piece of the infrastructure. So what is Acacia? Well, the Acacia is just the name that we put this Australian type of name for our um, infrastructure. And it is a high performance uh, storage system. So technically this is a Ceph system. And it's similar to Amazon S3, probably Many of you already have something stored in Amazon or your 
research team, it's very similar. So if you are already used on storing and retrieving data from there, basically the process is exactly the same with this local Ceph storage for us. Um, the total capacity is 60 petabytes. And for each of the projects, by default, they have assigned a one terabyte storage for all the users of that project. And every user have for themselves a hundred gigabytes of storage uh, just for them. So why two? Because anyone that uh, has access to a project uh, then has access to this one terabyte uh, space storage, but uh, everyone in the project can see anything from the other members of the project. And even this is um, important and a bit terrifying, they can even uh, delete uh, data from other users. All the data that is in this project is accessible to everyone. So in order to, um, when we were setting this up, we were sort of seeing ways of doing this, giving some kind of permissions to the, to the storage, but uh, it was the Ceph technology and the Amazon S3 type of uh, technology didn't allow us too much space to do that. So what we did was generate some other storage spaces to which only you have access. So if you want to keep private things, you need to store them in your own storage. And all the information that is um, really needs to be available for the rest of the project store, store it there in the project space. So we keep I keep saying object storage. Um, <clears throat> because this is not a file system, so it is very different. So anyone who hasn't used an object storage before will, will find it uh, very different. And there is probably one problem in the way I see the tools that are dealing with the object storage thing, that um, they sort of try to emulate the concept of the file system. So then I think that gets users a bit more confused probably because if it's emulating the file system that it seems to be a file system, then you forget it's not a file system, it's an object storage. But anyway, here in this graph, it is clear that things are different in the traditional file system is a, hierar a hierarchical file uh, system uh, linking, linking the files or the directories in a tree and you can organize them. You know that very well. That has been forever in Windows or in Linux. But in an object storage, the, the thing is that you have a single space for storing. It can be your project storage or your um, own user storage. And from there, people generate pockets. So, and that's it. That's the end of the organization. And then you put things inside the buckets. So, I guess this is something like in terms of physically how things are stored. They are really not stored in any kind of organization, but there is some keys that um, relate the blue things to this bucket or the green things, the green objects to this bucket. And with that uh, links or keys, you can access uh, your objects and uh, extract them from the bucket. So traditional file system is hierarchical. Um, directories organize things. This is very important. You can have as many directories as you want in a file system. Also, another thing very important, your files are there and you can edit them. You can modify them. You can read them and modify them at any time. The object storage is different. So basically it's saying that this is a flat structure. So basically just buckets 
but there are no i don't know if it's said here but there are there are no sub buckets so in the directories you can have as many sub directories as you want in the buckets you have just your buckets and that's it um also very important the objects are immutable so you cannot edit them directly in the object storage so it's the object storage is not a place to work with your files. Indeed, we are not calling them files anymore. We're calling them objects. So if you need to work with them, edit them, etc., don't put them in Acacia. You need to do all do that in Scratch. And we're, when you are done with that, then you put them in Acacia. If for some reason you need to modify them, basically, you need to bring them back to Acacia, modify, and then bring them up. That's the thing. Um, what else? Uh, each object is has a global unique identifier. That's the key. Uh, we will see how 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 the key uh, works in a minute. Mm. So the benefits of uh, the object storage. I don't know, they say excellent compromise between high performance, large capacity, and cost. So I guess the large capacity is a very important thing. You can, uh, the 60 petabytes is a huge amount of uh, storage space. High performance, okay, what they are saying is that access of, of your, access to your objects store there can be fast and can be retrieved relatively, relatively fast towards uh, anywhere you want them. And the cost, yeah, probably it is much more cheaper than, for example, the Lustre file system that we have for Scratch or for software. Another thing that is very important is that um, it is not attached for to the computer. So it is it has sort of global access. So you can access Acacia directly from your computer in a communication, direct communication to Acacia, you don't need to go through the login nodes. You don't need to go through Setonix or anywhere else. From your workstation, you can connect directly to Acacia. But also any other, of course, any other um, infrastructure we have at POSI has direct communication to Acacia. So in this schematic, this is Acacia. What we are drawing here is the S3 protocol to communicate with the object storage. And then our Nimbus cloud system or visualization system, or where is Setonix? Or Setonix uh, can communicate to Acacia. Okay, in the case of Setonix, basically we communicate Acacia to Scratch. That's how the data moves. Um, but you can be anywhere in the world in your workstation, direct communication with Acacia. And also data can be shared. So they don't need to be POSI members, POSI users. You can uh, just basically make some objects accessible to other users and send them a link and they can download the data from there. Okay, so the key thing here is basically that it is different for a, from a file system. So you need to learn new ways, new, new protocol to communicate with Acacia and to move your data. So first thing is you need to set up an account. <clears throat> so that is through... Um, here, the portal posi.org.au origin. So we call this portal origin is our system, a system that uh, is dedicated to manage the projects. And the, the piece of man management of Acacia is also there. Okay, so here you need to click Acacia. And within Acacia, if you want to have to set up your access for um, your project here in the storage name, 
you will find the list of projects you have. So I'm in these two projects. So I can figure, uh, try to find access to this project or to this other project. If you can see, this system is already telling me how many buckets are there and how many files are there. This is the size of each of the buckets. And this is what I have, basically, um, just some testing buckets. Now, if it's the first time, you will not have any bucket there. And it's also telling you something about the, the quota and how much you have used, etc. So you can do here view keys. And in the view keys, uh, you see how many keys you have generated. These keys are not the object keys. These keys are just basically like username and password for Acacia for you. Then <clears throat> if you click the create new key, that will generate sort of the username and the password for accessing Acacia. So you need to save this somewhere because this secret key will not be visible once you click the close button. So we have three clients and the people that made this origin uh, GUI already prepared some configuration uh, instructions depending on the client you are going to use. So the client is just basically the tool of choice for communicating with Acacia. You can use any of these. In these slides, we are using our clone. The MinIO client is going to be deprecated soon, so we are not touching it. But our clone or the AWS client are the tools of choice. And in this case, today, we are going to see a little bit of our clone. Um, and they give you here an example of how you can configure uh, your account inside Cetonix uh, to use. So what I will usually do is to copy what I have here because when I hit close, I'm going to lose it and copy it somewhere else. So for that, I you can use any kind of editor or anything. So I usually, these kind of things, I usually copy them here. This is the tool I use, so I just copy it. So that's what I have. Once you saved it temporarily there, you close. This is very slow. Okay, close. And now you see the access ID, but you don't see the secret key. I have two access IDs now generated for, for my space. You have a maximum of, of five keys to be generated and you can remove them if you want. Uh, the idea is for security to generate this kind of keys regularly, new keys and change your settings regularly just to be safe that your uh, your data is uh, safe and it's not being touched by anyone else. So after that, you can go into Cetonix what is happening and now you need to go to your home directory so you can do CD this curly thing now I'm in the home directory and you need to set up so that that things that you saved you need to put them in a configuration file in this case, we are going to use our clone. So let me check 
So that file, and that's that's in the that's in the slides. So that file should be in this direct directory. And if you don't have that directory, you can you should make it. So you do mk mkdir dash p, and then it is in config uh, our clone. So you need to create this directory. If the directory exists, this command will do nothing. So there's no issues. And then you go there. Config our clone. And you need to create that file. So you, if it's not there, you do, for example, bi rclone.conf and you create the file. <clears throat> so in my case, I have three spaces. So these are my three things, my three access keys. Of course, I will remove these access keys right now, immediately after the training to not make them available. And then <clears throat> this is the setting. So if you see um, the settings that were given directly from the origin are those. So you need to put inside that file a name. So this name is just sort of, as an, sort of a nickname. Uh, we call in our clone, they call that a remote. So you can put any name. So the tool is suggesting to put the name Espinosa, but I can put whatever name I want. And then these lines and this is the line for the given key this is the line for the access key so that's that's the way this configuration file is organized and i have three times that because that is i have access to three storage places okay so that's that's what is said here the, you get the keys. And also once you once you did that, you don't need this anymore. So this is a temporal a temporal thing. We don't need that anymore. And that is saved just here in your configuration file. Another thing to do that comes here in the slide is that um you need to change the um, you need to change the uh, permissions of that file to be only readable and writable by the user and by no one else. So you need to execute this command to their configuration file. And that. That will change the privileges of that file to be only read and write for the user and no one else can see it because it is important because all the keys of access are in that file. So no one else should be able to not even read them. So this is uh, important, guys. OK. So what else was there? OK. So the clients. This MinIO is a client that communicates with, with the storage. I'd say the MinIO client will be deprecated soon. Our clone is similar to our sync if you already use it. AWS client. Um, and in Python, you can also use Boto to communicate. There are some other tools that have also S3 communication protocol. You can use that from outside Cetonics, like in your own workstation with, for example, CyberDoc or WinSCP. But yeah, from inside Cetonics, we only use these ones. And they are set as modules, so you can find them as modules ready to be used. Um, this is what I told you. You edit the configuration file, and you put what was given by the key generator. You change the permissions. And basically, this is an example of what we just did. 
So now let's do let's put some things into the into the object storage. So the first command is to create a bucket. So if you can as I told you this this is some kind of the confusion. So for example, you want to make a bucket, but you use the command rclone mkdir, like if you were generating a directory. So that's what I meant with the confusion. So ideally, <clears throat> this should be rclone mk bucket, isn't it? Or I can buck, but it's not. So because rclone uh, works not only on object storages, it works also in file systems. So if you do our clone mkdir something, that will create a directory in your own uh, host file system. But to create a bucket in a remote place, you need to put mkdir and then indicate the path where the bucket is going to be created. So to integrate, in, indicate that is an object storage, you need to use this uh, colon. So that's why I'm underlining it to remember you to always use the colon. And this remote name is the name that you put in the configuration file. So here, this name. In my case, that name is Acacia Mine, but it's basically the name you use there. So I'm going to see it to scratch. Uh, CD Acacia test. Okay, so it was a module available our clone. So I see it's our clone one sixty two, so module load our clone. 162.2 and then our clone I can do list remotes so this is the first command to see what is set in my um, in my configuration file so these are the three names I put for the remotes so if I do our clone mkdir to create a bucket and then acacia mine colon and then the name of the bucket so this thing is important the name of the bucket needs to be unique among all the buckets in acacia like for all the users all the projects everything the name needs, needs to be unique so how to make a unique name you need to sort of think in a unique uh, uh, nickname to be added first in the name of the bucket. So in my case, I'm using, for example, the name of my project. So POSI, or let's use courses, 01. And then a second nickname related to me. And then the real name I want to put for the bucket, like um, training. And that creates the bucket. Now, the next command will be, for example, list the, the buckets that I have in Acacia Mine. So if I do R clone, so to list the buckets, the command is LSD. So again, D comes from directory, and LS comes from dist. But again, this is not a directory. It's going to be buckets. So to tell our clone that I'm going to list buckets in a remote uh, object storage, I do the name of my remote and the colon. So that is listing the buckets I have there. And there it is, the courses 01 AG. This is the bucket I have just created there. Um, 
Yeah, so let's say I want to remove a bucket. I'm, I want to remove, in this case, I'm going to remove this one, the nickname one, two, three. So our clone remove deer. No, yeah, remove deer, acacia, mine. Um, nickname one, two, three. Posse training. Hmm. Okay, bucket not empty. Well, then that's good. I cannot remove a bucket that is not empty. So let's remove the first one. Courses here one. A G training. There it is. So again, our clone list what is there. It's not there anymore. Okay. So what happens if you choose a name of a bucket that exists somewhere else? Well, I mean, it's owned by someone else, somewhere else in the object storage. For example, our clone, mkdir. I want to do Acacia mine uh, thesis. I know that somebody has that bucket. I don't know where it is, but I know that because if you list if you list the buckets, you see that that thesis is not here. So there's this problem: our clone and probably not of the Clients will give you an error if you try to generate a bucket that already exists. Basically, no error. So the way of checking if your creation is OK is with the listing. So we can list the files. For example, let's list the files inside. So I'm sorry, not files, objects. So let's list, list the objects in that nickname thing. Let's list what is there. So things are, uh, these are the files that are there. And if I try to list that thesis bucket that is somewhere else, then I get an error because that is not in my project, of course. If not, I will be able to see it and I will be able to list it. So the access is denied. So really that thesis thing was not created in the first place because it already existed. And then that's why I cannot see it in my space, but didn't give me an error. But when I try to list anything inside that bucket, then I get the error. So these LS commands are the ones that uh, need to be used for for checks. So that's what is so here existing buckets. Um, so you need to use them for checks, and that's that's the thing. So. Um, you use our clone copy to put things into Acacia. There are some, I don't know, peculiarities that you can uh, check when you go through the examples. And there is the our clone delete to remove things. This our clone copy can be used to copy things, to copy objects from your file system towards Acacia or from Acacia towards your file system. So you just basically swap the target, always using that colon for your remote space in Acacia. Now, delete is a very, uh, I don't know, um, uh, well, dangerous because as I told you, you have access to all the data of your project. So indeed, we were sort of talking that uh, if you want to delete anything in your project, you need to talk with your supervisor in the project 
and ask them to do it because yeah, it is sort of um, dangerous, like uh, really dangerous because you have access to to their space. But anyway, uh, when you are testing this, just try it in your own space. Don't don't train in the in the project space. And also, you can use the dash dash dry run option. So you can add this piece here in the part of the options. And with that, that is not going to delete anything, but it's going to give you back information of what it will delete if you execute the delete command without the dry run. Then you can check. So what I always do is to execute the delete command with the dry run first, check that specifically it is really just deleting what I want, then remove the dry run and delete things. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. Uh, there are some several examples there for you to check. Uh, and the final example for sharing information with others. But yeah, I'm sorry for that. I needed to rush, but I, yeah, I think that's the end of my presentations.